four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. What I'll do is I'll get out of the room so you can do it. So you yeah, you use phone? yeah, that's okay. You're right. Uh, the, you know, the, the stories, there certainly has been enough for I can't, I don't know another band or a group of musicians in the last 25 years that more has been written about. Is it all true? I mean, you guys <laughs> were here in California. I mean, the start of it, the origins, you and Ray and so forth. Yeah, everything is true that you read in the books, pretty much, you know, a little exaggeration here and there, but it's all based on fact. When uh, you, you were at UCLA, you would come down from somewhere? Or yeah, yeah, I was from, uh, I had been in Santa Barbara, come down to UCLA, where Jim and Ray were at the film school at UCLA, even though I didn't exactly meet them in UCLA, because I was in the psychology or physics, and... Uh, the um, drummer, John Densmore, is the one who met them first. Uh, he met uh, Ray at the meditation course, the Maharishi's meditation. And I was there too, but at that time they only needed a drummer, so John uh, got with him like that, and then later got me in the band because they needed a guitar player because Ray's brothers had finked out. You had been playing with somebody before that? Yeah. I was in, a, in another group at the time. Not real serious or anything, you know. At the time, you know, if I thought that I was going to, uh, you know, I never had the uh, the the thought that I would ever uh, take rock and roll to be my profession, you know. I never thought that would be a smart way to make money, but it was more of a diversion at the time, you know. But uh, the way it worked out, it was fine. Uh, meeting the rest of the guys, uh, as you said, you. You, you think it's going to be a living, but do you have any sense of of what was going to come out of here musically? What, at the time? Yeah, at the time. Uh, I don't have any sense. Well, I think so. I mean, you know, the stuff musically that we did uh, later in the albums, uh, it wasn't that much different than the, the stuff on the first album. So that the, the chemistry immediately sparked something... Yeah, there was amazing chemistry in that band. You know, I don't know if it's like that in all bands. Uh, I know I've been in many bands after the Doors, and not one of them has, has that spark at all. You know, you, what you need is four guys or five guys who are equally uh, at the same spot in their uh, in their. Uh, um, in their, uh, which cog they're on and finding what they're going to do in life, you know? It's like, they, uh, you know, you can't have one guy who's a total dedicated musician, another guy who's just in it for the girls, you know, another guy who's just uh, learning music maybe, and another guy, you know, we were all pretty much in the same spot somehow, psychically. And uh, for some reason, the way we rehearsed and stuff, it was uh, very automatic, you know, it was like no questions were asked. It was like, you do this, you do this, you do this. And it was like there was no leader, really. And it was uh, just automatic. It just worked, worked out. And nobody ever argued. No, uh, Nobody ever uh, said, I won't sing that song or, you know, it was just great. It had to be very electric. Thing. Yeah, it was an amazing thing, you know. I didn't realize it at the time, you know, because I'd never been... A, I'd only been in one or two groups before, and none of them were, li were like this. Music, you're talking mid-60s, uh, music was starting to play a very major role in the whole social consciousness. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, we, we didn't really care about that, you know, social-wise. Well, I, I, I didn't mean uh, messages, I mean, but rock and roll music became all of a sudden a thing that everybody wanted to put bands so many people want to put yeah, yeah although not quite yet you know like when we put our band together there still weren't a lot of bands it was like you know the, the love the buffalo springfield the doors and a couple other groups made you know in town and everybody else was a joke whose records did you did you listen to um uh rock and roll wise yeah well we liked love we like the Rolling Stones record, the Animals, the Yardbirds, Jimi Hendrix, 
you know, a lot of English stuff. And other than that, it was old blues stuff, John Lee Hooker, Robert Johnson, and um, jazz, Art Blakey, and that kind of stuff. Robbie, was there any sign at that time of some of the angst and the, the, the drama that was going to come out of this band? Uh, at, at which time and now? Uh, when you just were getting together. Just getting you together? It was terrific, that the music was great. Uh, and yeah, I think so. I think the very first rehearsal, I think it was uh, um, a shape of things to come because it, at the end of the rehearsal, Jim got this guy walks in the room and Jim just jumped on this guy. He just started haranguing this guy for no apparent reason, you know. And it was about some dope deal, I think. And you know, no matter what the guy had done, he did not deserve that what he was getting. I thought. And uh, I couldn't, I really couldn't understand it, you know. I mean, the guys had told me, hey, this guy's crazy, but I didn't believe it. But uh, I don't know, he never did that to me. How much, how much of a part did drugs play in, in, in the band at that time? At that time, not that much, really. Not too much. Jim, uh, you know, of course, was into uh, psychedelics at that, that time, which was, Fine, you know. He did some of his best shows at that time. Later, when he turned to alcohol, is when it went bad. How soon after you, uh, after these first meetings and these first rehearsals, did you get a band to get to play anywhere in front of people? Well, before the record, we were playing for people. That, that, that's I mean, before how soon before? Oh, uh, how long did it take until uh, you were ready to stand up on a stage and play <laughs> at the? Uh, London Fog or whatever those places were. Well, let's see. We rehearsed for about, say, a month, you know, at my parents' house or at Ray's house or whatever. And then uh, then that's when we started getting gigs. We got a gig at my parents' friend's house, the doctor guy. And then we got a gig at, the, uh, at Ray's uh, mother's, uh, where she worked or something, at the aircraft company. And, uh, you know, little parties here and there. Were you playing your own songs or were you yeah. playing hits? You playing? Both. And, and what was the genesis of the songs? And the hits? Who wrote and... Oh, of our songs? Yeah. It was mostly Jim and myself. Did you write lyrics as well as music? Yeah, I wrote some lyrics. Uh, I wrote... I ended up writing most of the hit songs, you know, like Light My Fire, Love Me Two Times, Touch Me, um, Love Her Madly. Those are all my songs. Had early on, when you were just playing these parties and before the record deal, before the whiskey, were any of those songs in the uh, in the lineup? Or? Just Light My Fire and Love Me Two Times. You were doing those that early? Yeah, that was Light My Fire was, was the first song I ever wrote. How did you work out arrangements? Um, we'd all work them out together. That's uh, one good thing we did, is everybody just automatically kind of knew what part to play. Uh, how musical was Jim Morris as, as, a, as a musician? Not really very, but he, he could pound around on the piano pretty good, and uh, he could fake playing a harmonica pretty good. <laughs> but that's about it. You know, he really wasn't uh, musical. You couldn't say, okay, uh, hit a B flat, Jim. You know, he was not like a Frank Sinatra who could read a chart and sing. But did he have uh, how much input did he have into the arrangements of, of the music? Mm, not a lot. Not a lot. Uh, you and Ray and, and John, all three contributed equally, or? Yeah, pretty much. After uh, okay, now you're uh, you're out of the London fog, and how did you get to the whiskey? Well, the London Fog was up the street from the Whiskey, so Eddie Ho was a drumming up at the Whiskey with, let's see, who was he with? Do you remember who he played with? I can't remember, right? Oh, God. Huh. I'll remember it. I'll remember in a minute. Wasn't there a girl named Ronnie Heron? Yeah. Or? So he took Ronnie Heron up there, and they both freaked out. And, and who was she? She booked the Whiskey. And so she booked the doors. And immediately, what 
what did you become? You're the house band? Or? Yep, the, we became the house band. And we we played with such groups as them, Buffalo Springfield, the Turtles, B.B. Um, King, uh, Otis Redding, John Lee Hooker. Were, they, were any of them listening to you guys? I, you know, they didn't end up listening once in a while. Did you have any encouragement over that time? Or? Oh, Lord. Not, not really a lot. <laughs> the, the, uh, the doors at the whiskey, was that pretty much what the doors were? I mean, in terms of sound and musical attack and so forth, was that it? The doors at the whiskey? I mean, when, when you were playing as a house band. Yeah, that was pretty representative, you know. I wish they'd filmed that whole time, you know. Because we had some renditions of the end there that would have been incredible on film, you know. Stupidly, we never did get a decent version on film of the end, which there, was our really our best piece. Eventually, there was a lot of film on the doors. Right? Yeah, but nothing any good. Yeah. What happened next to get you a record deal? Do you remember that? Um, well, we had, we had uh, knocked on every door in town, but nobody wanted it. Um, Billy James signed us up for Columbia, but they passed, uh, they passed, they let us out in six months or something. And who else? Oh, uh, finally some people started wanting to do it, you know. The, Zappa wanted to produce us, and then, uh, uh, Terry Melcher wanted to produce us. But we didn't want a producer. We wanted a record label. So finally, uh, Jack Holzman came, and he was from Electra, and he uh, he didn't like it. Was it Jack's wife Nina? Had she seen you before? Or yeah, I think so. Or yeah. or had she? I think she saw us at the whiskey, yeah. but she probably talked him into it. And uh, uh, when w w were things weird starting to happen uh, at this point? band? Was it getting uh, the signs that you were seeing when Jim jumped on the, the guy early on? Uh, well, no, we didn't see that kind of stuff yet. But we uh, we went out to other little gigs around the area. And uh, some pretty weird stuff started happening. Like in, in uh, Swing Auditorium, San Bernardino, like Jim kicked this light off of the stage and slash some girl's eye open and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we sort of knew we had to kind of be careful a little bit. How did you guys deal with that? Uh, not very well. Uh, you know, we got, we tried getting bodyguards and stuff like that. Uh, what else did we do? Uh, what did the rest of the three of you talk about, or did you... Goddamn, <laughs> like, goddamn Jim wouldn't know I'd have to do this or that, you know. It was like the three of us against him all the time, you know. Did you talk with him a little while? Oh, yeah, well, you know, and I was sort of his confidant most of the time anyway. But uh, he knew he couldn't push me too far, so he never did, like he did some of the other people. But... Uh, I don't know. He was a weird guy, you know. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> one of the great understatements <laughs> of the time. When you got to, to do your first record for Electra, they brought in Paul Rothschild. What was the uh, band's reaction to working with a producer? Now? Well, we didn't know about producers, but we saw his name on the Paul Butterfield record, which was great. We loved that record, so it was fine, you know. Plus, the guy had just gotten out of jail, so we figured he couldn't be too bad. <laughs> Especially for what he went in for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and can you tell me something about the recording experience? What went on? The easy part? Fast? Well, no, most of it was easy and fast because we were so well rehearsed, you know. Just turn the mics on and go. Was there any input from Paul that was valuable here? Yeah, you know, he was saying, do this on the guitar more or something like that. But, um,. You know, it wasn't all that necessary for, you know, because there was not much production at the time. It was only a four track. And uh, it was, um, 
you know, a couple of weird things happened in the studio. Like when when we did the end, Jim was so strung out on acid that he was totally uh, out of hand, you know. What happened? Oh, he threw a TV set through the control room window, for one thing. <laughs> um, for a second thing, is he, he kept on... He was on this Oedipus complex trip, you know, and he kept saying, fuck the mother, kill the father, god damn it, fuck the mother, kill the father, and just going, ranting on like that for hours, you know. So finally we get him in to record, and he did it great, you know. But then he wasn't, so then we decided he was too high to continue. So we closed up uh, the session, but Jim didn't want to stop. So he climbed back into place, and he started having fun by hosing down the entire place with a fire extinguisher, <laughs> including all the instruments. You guys were there? No. We left, but Paul Rothschild jumped the wall and, uh, and dragged him out of there, which is pretty good. Uh, well, could you have felt that there was going to be a long-term future for this band? <laughs> this guy was... Uh, no, it was day-to-day. -day. You, you really believe it? really did. That was very nerve-wracking. Even before that, I had that feeling. From the very, even before we ever had a gig, it was like that because one day we had a rehearsal and uh, and we get a call from Blythe, California. Jim, where are you? We're supposed to have a rehearsal today. Come on, you guys, take some ass and come out to Blythe and we'll rehearse out here. You know? <laughs> no, Jim, can't do that. You come back, you know, and he never came back. He came back finally with us black eye and I got in a fight. What, was he beaten up a, a lot uh, along the way? You know? Not a lot, but what? he tended to make people beat him up and to push people to do that. Without getting into deep psychology or psychiatry, was there any, could you figure out any reason why this self-destructive kick early on <laughs> was going on? No, I didn't. But later I, you know, I realized after meeting his mother that there was some problem there. Now the band makes his first record with some just brilliant songs. The Break On Through, was. did you write that? No, Jim wrote that. Uh, but Light My Fire and The End were, were in that first album. Yeah. Uh, you heard your records on the radio. What, what kind of sense was this now? That was the greatest, yeah. the greatest thing, you know. Because we, we'd be calling and disguising our voice, you know, and requesting. <laughs> And they always used to bust us. Had you, did you get out on the road at all? Were you out of Los Angeles? Yeah. So? Oh, yeah. This is your first time out? No, we'd gone out here and there. Yeah. Played the Fillmore and stuff. But never on an extensive tour. And what was the reaction on the tour? Great. Oh, yeah, they loved it. What was your reaction to being out there? <laughs> yeah, I didn't like it myself. Because it was a big babysitting gym time, you know. What were some of the things that happened out there? Oh, just, you know, riots when we played. That was the main thing. But other than that, you know, Jim would just go off with anybody and get drunk and uh, make us wonder if he was going to show up at the show or not. Was you know, there anybody, he always did. Was there anybody that had any control at all? No. Or influence? Not. not really. You know, Rothschild seemed to have some power over him. Who was managing you at this time? Oh. Uh, was there a manager for the band? I think Bill Siddons was the manager. Was it Asher Dan? Was he? Asher Dan was there for a while, but he, <laughs> he aced him out. Sal Bonifetti and Asher Dan, uh, they were <laughs> at the request of Max Fink, <laughs> who was our lawyer. Uh, they got in there for a while, but they were no good because they were trying to split the band up, you know. You know how managers do sometimes. Did you guys like each other? Uh, yeah, at first. <laughs> I became to dislike Jim intensely after a while. Everybody? I think so. I think so. I mean, it's not as though you dislike a guy, it's just that, you know, I loved him when he was straight. But when he was drunk, it was like two different people. What kind of division of time was that? 50-50, 70-30 drunk? It depends, uh, you know, on the time period. It's like sometimes it was 50-50, uh, other times it was 10-90, other times it was 90-10, you know? 
How about the, the other three of you? Did you guys get along? No. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah, then we did very well because we were so, we were like three of us against Jim, you know. Yeah. But when Jim died, boy, we didn't get along at all. Yeah. <laughs> it was like division of power or something. I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, it, there was never a thought of replacing him or, uh, or would not have been the same thing? Or? Um, no, we never thought of that. I mean, when he died, we did think that we could try, but we never got around to actually trying anybody. Well, you had, if you were writing songs and, and writing so many of the songs, you really had had to spend some time with him discussing this for albums and things, didn't you? What, writing songs yeah, with Jim? Yeah, about songs that you were going to do. And sure. How did those meetings go? Great. Couldn't be better, you know, like... One time he stayed at my house for a couple of weeks and we wrote a bunch of the songs. And he was fine, you know, he wasn't high or anything. Is this for the second album? Or the mm, that was for the first and second. First and second album. And third. Did you ever have, you know, there are, there are people who have great excesses in their life, but when they get down to doing their music, they're serious about it. Uh, was that the case with, uh, with Jim Morrison? Mm. Yeah, you could say that. Never thought of it that way. What other interests did he have? Did... None. None. Absolutely. Getting high and... <laughs> Getting... <laughs> <laughs> Fucking off. Well, you had this enormous success. And you started... You guys... Did you have a sense of how big you were? Or... Not big enough. <laughs> that was how it was. Jim never thought we were big enough. Where did you Where did you want to go? Where did he... Well, he, he thought we should be at least as big as the Stones. But... Um, it never f happened fast enough for him. He kept saying, you know, it was like, why isn't it faster? You know, look at how the Beatles were just whoosh, straight up. Because I think he had a sense of time that he wasn't going to live all that long and he had to do it in a certain space or something. I don't know. Was it going fast enough for you guys? Yeah. Were you making some money and yeah. things then? And what was life like on the road for a bunch of Californians? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I didn't like it myself much because it was, uh, you know, all, all the groupies, all they want to know is, was Jim, you know, where's Jim? <laughs> you know, you could always get a second yeah. hand-me-down. And anyway, I was married for most of the time anyhow. But uh, I hate traveling, you know. But playing was, was always fun, you know. But the bigger the halls started getting, the worse the shows would get because Jim's show was not geared to a large hall. And then that's another reason why he started getting drunk is because he, he was frustrated that he couldn't reach the audience. The only way he could reach him was to get him totally crazy, you know. You have a... You must have had a sense that you were headed for some disaster uh, in a big show somewhere. Why? Well, uh, that if you had, had a thing at the swing auditorium early on and he's getting more frustrated that somewhere along the line the crowd would get... Yeah, that's true. <laughs> when was the first uh, the first real bad one? Was that New Haven or was that Chicago? Or yeah, New Haven. New Haven. What happened there? Oh, Lord. Um... Well, Jim and I went out to get a drink before the show, and he wasn't drunk, really. So then we went back, and then so he's in the dressing room with some bimbo, right? And uh, the cop comes in and thinks he's a hippie, tells him to get out, and Jim starts arguing with him. And the guy maced him. So he's pissed off, you know. So finally, they said, let bygones be bygones, and they shook hands and everything. Jim and the cop, and then uh, <clears throat> on stage, Jim started telling the story during during one of the songs, you know. And uh, the cops didn't like that, so they come up on stage and hauled him off. Right. Did he arrested him? Yeah, right in the middle of the show. What happened with the crowd? They left. <laughs> what? Uh, in the, Life magazine. There was uh, an episode on the Ed Sullivan show too. Can you tell us about that? One? Yeah, um, that was when Light My Fire was number one. And so we were going to do Light My Fire. But they didn't think, get much higher. That was offensive to them. So we couldn't say that. So they asked him, 
not to say that. And of course he did say it anyway. I think he just forgot, really. But, uh, oh God, Bob Preck was jumping up and down. <laughs> it was like a little kid. He did it. He did it. How can he do that when he said he wouldn't do that? Were there any other television shows <laughs> you did? National Network shows? Oh God. Smothers Brothers was. How did you like doing television? Yeah, it was okay. You know, it's not real, you know. What was getting you a kick during this time? What was getting most fun out of it? Mmm, most fun. Well, I like the whole thing, you know. <laughs> you know, I like being able to be in the background without being the front man and take all the abuse but still uh, have fun, you know. Were, were Ray and uh, John feeling the same way or did they want to be up front? Do you want I don't know. I can't tell. John Densmore is a very dramatic guy, you know. So he would, you know, I'm not doing these drumming things, you know. But, uh, you know, he's trying to be an actor now. Now you came back for the second album. How tough was that to do? Uh, which one? The, uh, the, the album after The Doors, The, uh, the Strange Days. Uh, it was the second album, wasn't it? The second album. Yes. How hard was that? Yeah. It wasn't hard. But were there new songs, or were there songs that you had been performing? Yeah, that most of them are already, we knew, you oh, know. I see. So this was There's still a couple new ones, you know, so it wasn't difficult at all, except for Paul Rothschild went crazy with the studio, because he's <laughs> heard, heard uh, of Sgt. Pepper's, and he wanted to, uh, you know, use all the crazy stuff in the studio, and backwards tracks and everything. That was fun. Uh, well, were you I, happy? How happy were you with the with the second album with the music? Oh, wow, I thought it was great. Yeah. yeah, it was my favorite album. And what had you written in that album? Oh gosh. Not, well, let's see. Love me two times was on that record. Uh, Lost little girl, I believe, was on that. Was that on that record? Yeah. So I got to get a list of the yeah. discography here. Was there? A, <laughs> was. What was the major hit out of that one? Well, Love Me Two Times was going to be a hit, except New Haven happened right in the middle of it, and it knocked it out of the box. Well, what happened? What was the result of the New Haven? They took it off the air. Was it backlash everywhere? A bummer. What was the record company doing about that? I don't know. There had been a lot of national publicity on the New Haven thing? Yeah, it was in Life Magazine. Life Magazine. <laughs> and these were signs of times to come then? Though. Really? When was the next... Horror story on a stage. Oh. At Chicago? Or? Next horror story. The next incident. Oh. <laughs> um, probably not till Miami, major incident wise. There had been some rioting in Chicago and New York. And, uh, yeah, but that's just normal, you know. It's a pretty big riot in Singer Bowl in New York. What, what, Have you ever been there? What, yes, what uh, caused that? I don't know, they just, uh, after we went off, they just started destroying the place. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's because we didn't play enough or what, we played good. What kind of outrageous things was Jim doing on stage now? Uh, well, he's falling down and writhing on the ground like a snake and stuff like that. But, uh... <laughs> well, how, how'd you feel when all that was happening? Were you paying attention to it? <laughs> I was, was kind reaction? of oblivious to, you know, I knew Jim didn't really mean that stuff, but... I knew he really was into it a lot too, and I knew that he had to push himself to do more and more of that stuff as the crowds got bigger, you know, which I felt sorry for him for. Were there ever band meetings or ever discussions while you were on the road about where you were going and what was going to happen? No. <laughs> we weren't uh, much clued in on the band. You know, I was because I, I cared, but the other guys didn't. And did you ever spend any time with Jim? Oh, yeah, quite a bit. Like I say, he used to stay at my house yeah. when we were outside. I, I mean, after, now after the second album and things are getting a little worse. No, then uh, I tried to stay away from him yeah. as much as possible because when you get on these drunks, you know, you just be totally dangerous and out of it. What was, what was the women's situation with the whole band? You were married, and what about everybody else? Ah, uh, let's see. Ray, Ray and Dorothy were married. 
John Densmore. Let's see, what time was this now? This is 68, 69, yeah. 68, the second album. Uh, third album. Third album, it's just... Yeah. John had just met his girlfriend. I had just met a girlfriend, too. And... But we weren't married. And Jim Morrison? Jim had his girlfriend, but he had his problems, because... Either she was cheating on him or he was cheating on her or something. Who was she? Yeah. Pamela Kersal. She's still around? No, she died. Oh, she did die? Yeah. Who was with him in, in France? Was it, was it Pamela that was with him when he died? Uh, yeah. Yeah. How long after did she die? Let's see. It wasn't too long. There are some, some people feel that the first two albums were the best. How do you feel about that? I think uh, you could say that too. You know, they were the well, most well rehearsed. Yeah. Although I like stuff about every other, all the other albums too. What what went on with the third album, with the recording session? Um, third album. So, well, well, a lot, a lot of Jim getting drunk and bringing drunken friends into the studio, and Paul throwing them out, and a lot of scenes and. Heavy scenes, heavy pill taking and stuff. So it was it was rock and roll to its fullest, I'd say. Jack Holtzman get involved very much in all this? Not really. Yeah. Not really. Well, there was some it, incident. Well, he's in New York. Mostly. Well, was there some incident in New York where you guys try to break into his house or his apartment? That's what they say. I don't know. Were you there? No. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jim was wanted to get into uh, to Jack's apartment. And he had some friends with him, and he, and he, I forget what he did, because yeah, well, I wasn't there. It wasn't a terrific story. <laughs> no. you, you said you met uh, Jim's mother. Did you meet his father, too? Uh, no. And, and what was there about the mother that gave some no. kind of explanation? She was a totally domineering bitch. Oh, yeah? Totally. Yeah. Did he, he had brothers and sisters, too. Uh -huh. Not much to do with any of those people, though? Well, the brother was, like, I'm not a bad, bad guy, you know? But the uh, sister, she was a dum-dum. Yeah, she married this English guy who used to beat her up and stuff. And, you know, it was a very, very uh, normal run-of-the-mill family, except for Jim. <laughs> <laughs> now... The, at, as of the third album, things started to go downhill, didn't they, for the band, or did they? Yeah. Well, after the first album, things started going downhill. <laughs> In fact, I remember Paul Rothschild saying, um, well, we couldn't get Jim to come in one day to record. God damn it, let's get that guy in here and just record everything we know, man, because we may not be having him around much longer. <laughs> you know, it's after a big acid trip or... I had to go and save him and his girlfriend from dying or something. And I dropped him off at the park, you know, because I knew that couldn't, he couldn't record that day. And was there a sense that it would soon, for you, uh, that it would soon end and you were thinking beyond the band at all? Yeah, what were you all, all, the, all the time. Yeah. What did you want to do? Uh, I never really came to a conclusion. <laughs> and and were you still writing? Yeah. 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 Luckily, always writing. Yeah. And and the, and what was going on with the personal appearances? What what led up to Miami? What happened in Miami? Well, Miami was uh, Jim was late. Pam was late. She was supposed to be coming with him, and he, he she made him late, so he got pissed. And uh, I don't know whether it was because he had seen this theater piece done with all this nudity and stuff the day before, but he was, was obsessed with uh, taking it off, you know, on stage. He never really did go far enough to whip it out, though. And there? I was there. Yeah, and he did it there? Where? In Miami? He didn't whip it out, I'm no. saying. What but happened? What? I don't know. It's yeah. just a stupid thing. Yeah, you want me to take it all off, you know, or you want to see this, you know. But he didn't do it. And what was, what happened with the crowd then? I know you're repeating a story. But oh, they were, they were, uh, 
writhing around. I mean, there's no air conditioning in this overfilled building. And no sitting room. It's all standing up, packed together. And somehow Jim got thrown off the stage. And all I could see is this big snake of people following Jim around like this and like this. I said, I'm getting out of here. And just before the stage collapsed, I jumped off and made it up to the balcony. It's a dangerous thing. And what was the uh, what was the fallout effect of that? Nothing, you know. Jim finally made it to the dressing room. We had a couple of beers with the cops, and uh, that was it. And then the newspapers. And a private citizen had made a uh, citizen's arrest, not Jim, exposing himself. So. Backstage or something like that? On, on stage. On stage? Yeah. And, and what happened? Um, well, you know, that went to Miami court, and uh, we all went to court, uh, you know, to help Jim out. And uh, it was very interesting, really, how the Dade County Court works, you know. But it was ridiculous. And you came back to California, you were still a band? Yeah. And what, what went on next after that? Uh, let's see. I don't remember which gig we did. Did you do more dates after that? Yeah, but not very many because no one wanted us. And what kind of impact did that have on radio play for you? Bad. You know, everything was com coming down and going bad because of the whole, whole Miami bullshit trip. But in a way, I think Jim may have wanted that, you know. He, he didn't uh, like his image anymore. You know, he was getting fat and everything, and he looked like a, a pool player more than anything else. And had you made a decision to break up or to take a break? Or? No, but we did decide Jim had wanted to go to Paris to write some poetry, and Pam had been harping on him to do that. So they did that. And I think the three of us went to England. Or no, no, that wasn't until after he died. Um, no, the three of us stayed back home and we were continuing to rehearse and stuff for when he got back. Which he didn't. Had you played outside the United States while as a band? Yeah. Where? Um everywhere. Did you go to England or yeah. Japan too? Or? Not Japan, but everywhere in Europe. How successful was all that? It's great. Was there the same controversy or not? Um, yeah, but not as much, you know. One one gig in Amsterdam he missed because he swallowed a block of hash. <laughs> How well behaved or unbehaved was he on the European part of the trip? I'm trying to remember. I think he was, just because there was so much to see and, and do that kept him distracted, you know. It seems strange, a, a band, four guys, that there could be this enormous division and the band could survive. How did that explain? <laughs> it was a balance of yeah. power, you know. Yeah. It's really. And uh, who was, in, in musically, did you deal with Ray and John a lot? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I wrote, if I didn't write the words to the song, I would write most of the music. And uh, Ray would be helpful in arranging it, and John. But, uh, you know, a lot of the songs Jim and I wrote together. When was the last time you saw Jim? She was... The last time I saw him. Must have been at the office before he left for Paris. What was, what was the last date that you played together? Do you remember that, right? That, I believe, was New Orleans. And do you have some explanation as to why the, the ongoing uh, interest and, and mystique surrounding this band long after you stopped making records? What's, what's your reading on that? 
Well, part of it is uh, just um, nobody has come along that's better. And, uh, you know, the records still hold up. But the DJs had, you know, a lot of DJs really became friends of the Doors and had never stopped playing the stuff. Like Jim Ladd, KLOS. And you said that there was a uh, big rift in the band after uh, he died. What was your, what was the rift and what were your plans? Um, well... No, wait a minute, when was this exactly? After he died, you said After there he was died. real division. Yeah, it got worse and worse. We did two albums together without Jim. And, you know, it was okay, but then by the time the third one came around, you know, I wanted to go one way, John the other, and Ray the other way. So I couldn't continue as the Doors. Had you thought of uh, adding a vocalist in the band? Yeah, in fact, that's why we went to England to try to find a uh, vocalist. But so much of the personality of that band was stamped by what kind of character he was. It had to be a very difficult thing to try to <laughs> reform them. Yeah. Um, uh, it was. But, you know, we're really, we, we, we started too early. We should have let there be a space after he died. But we were afraid that it would all die out if we didn't, you know. But looking back, it was a stupid thing to do. Just speculating, had Jim Morrison come back and still lived, what would the future of that band have been? Um, blues. I was singing all blues. That's what he was real obsessed by at the end there, singing the blues. He fancied himself to be a B.B. King or something like that. What musical influence uh, affected you most of all? Which one? Like blues or? I would say flamenco music. Oh, really? At first, yeah. And then blues and jazz and uh, everything. But uh, flamenco's, uh, I first played flamenco when I was a kid. And, but the, the Doors never were a real blues band as such, though. No, but we could have been. Have been. We did play gigs where all we'd play is blues. You said when you got together that this unusual situation of four guys all in sync pretty much. Uh, when did it start to get out of sync? Was it almost immediately? Or? Well, I mean the three of us or the four? The, the, the four of you. Cause was it because of him that threw everything off track? Well, we were not out of sync. We were in sync, really. Yeah. But uh, there was a balance that was always there, you know. It wasn't as though it was out of sync. It was just that he was... It was just a question of how far out he would go, you know. And the, the further out he'd go, the more we'd just have to bend the other way and keep it all together. See, we were... Jim was born on the 1st of December... Uh, no, John was. Jim on the 8th. Me on the 8th of January. And Ray on the 1st of uh, February. See, so it's very evenly dispersed around the horoscope. And I think that's what kept us together. It was amazing. How long at all was it, Robbie? That the, How that, that the band, from beginning to end... Short, bright light. Yeah, it was short. It was five, six years. And uh, you've you've been in some bands since that time. Yeah, I've been in bands here and there, but bands are not the the same. You know, they're always. <laughs> you know, it's like most bands are one dictator and the rest followers. But uh, our band was was like no leaders. Democracy. Yeah, it really was. And you know, people thought Jim was, but Jim, he was so scatterbrained, he could never be a leader. Wasn't it on the last band, the uh, last album, that uh, Paul Rothschild was no longer on the case? Or yeah. What happened there? Oh, uh, I don't know. I think he was preoccupied with something. But, uh, you know, he blamed it on the fact that he didn't like the music or something. 
which was silly because there was some great music on that last uh, album. Who came in and finished the album? Well, Paul never started. Oh. Bruce and Romick did it with us, co-produced. How, were you happy with the uh, the last album? The last album. Yeah, very much. Was that the, the weird scenes inside the gold mine? Oh, no, the, the lady. Uh, mm, no, yeah, it was L.A. Woman. L.A. Lady, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, what had you written in that one? An L.A. Woman? Yeah, L.A. Woman. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, just the music. Yeah. For, for a lot of the songs? Or? Yeah. yeah. And I, I did write the words, too, to a couple of them. Love or Madly. Uh... What else is on that record? Strange Days. Strange Days was the second album, then 13, and Weird Signs. And how many albums in all did you guys do? Well, Counting Greatest Hits? Yes. Um, must have been 12 or so, counting, counting those. You did Greatest Hits about three times. Right. <laughs> was live. There seems to be a lot of film footage available. Uh, was that done intentionally? How did that happen? Well, we had a film crew follow us around. But that wasn't until too late, unfortunately. Yeah. We're stupid. We should have had somebody at the beginning because that's when we were playing our best. But you never think of those things, you know. <laughs> What's happened to that project that Bill Graham had? He was going to develop a door story, wasn't he? Yeah, we may have to uh, get that going. That business moves along uh, with all the speed of uh, Glacier. You know? Really, it's ridiculous. anything done. I, that's a year and a half ago. I helped him clear the music and made a deal for the record with Bob Krasno and the like. <laughs> the records. Uh, uh, how's the sale of the records, though? Great. Yeah. yeah well, what right. sells? Which ones sell? Jeez, I don't know which ones, but I would guess it's all the original ones. You know, I don't know. No, the the uh, the new uh, the slash one with the red uh, cover. Oh yeah. That one did real good, platinum. Well, the one we uh, we cleaned up one and just the greatest hits remastered and re something that was that was very successful. I remember. Was it? Yeah. What was the cover like? Uh, well, I can't remember. I I know we got Bruce in and we got somebody else in to clean those things up and to. Uh, are there any on? Uh, well, there's one on a compact disc, isn't it? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, it doesn't sound good? Though. Horrible. It's embarrassing, really. I've got it and I've never played it. I, I still play the disc. I like the well, disc. Mickey Cap, for some reason, has thrown a monkey wrench into the... Mo Mobile Fidelity wants to put a box set out. Of oh, they do. CDs yeah. and... Sure. And uh, Mickey Cap won't let him do it. I don't know, he's an idiot. Because they've done the Beatles and Sinatra. Yeah. And, uh, and then the Rolling Beatles, Stones. the Stones, and the Doors. You know, think how that would look. Yes, and Frank Sinatra. And you know, Sinatra. Talking, company, huh? They're talking, that's a pretty good company to be in. Yeah. I'll find out why. Did you? I will find out why. Okay, great. Because that's there's no reason in the world, you know. It, if Elector wanted to put out something, it wouldn't be the same market even. No, no. You know? No, they go for a very high end market. Yeah. They charge a lot of money for it. They sell it in a few catalogs, right. which a lecture would never do. I can't imagine a lecture doing it anyhow. They won't do it. Yeah. Any moment or moments in the in that brief career that stick out in your mind that were at their best that you thought it was really terrific? Hmm. Start or anything that you mind you? Um, how about if I think about that and I get back to you? Okay, that'll be fine. Anything that was the worst? The end of it? The worst. Ah, oh, gosh. Let me think about that, too. Okay. You know, it's I not interesting if you have a perspective and say, you know, there are ball players, athletes, who will say there was a period in their career when nothing goes wrong. When the, if they're baseball players, the ball is coming up to the plate slower and looks bigger. Mm -hmm. And if a basketball player, it doesn't matter where they shoot it from, it goes <laughs> in the basket. And, and for, for his people in who make records, there's a period like that. And maybe for you guys it was the first couple of records, I don't know. Uh, that everything, that you were at the top of your own game. You know? Yeah. Do you recall any string like that? Or do you want to think about that? Too? 
<laughs> no, we were, we were, uh, it seemed uh, everything we did was uh, gold, you know. But uh, the funny thing is, we never doubted it for a minute that we weren't going to be, you know. Because we knew immediately that we had the best material of any group, you know. We knew that we had the best looking singer of any group. So how else could it, what could go wrong, you know? How much did it change you, the whole experience, being in the doors? Being in the doors? I don't, uh, I don't really know. You know, I never, I never was one for the ego trips of uh, being on stage and stuff like that. Anyway, so. And it didn't affect you, your picture being out there and who you were. Right, I don't care about that. So, uh, probably should have cared a little more. <laughs> yeah. And uh, did it change the others a great deal? Jim just gradually deteriorated. And... Yeah, I don't know if you can say that it affected him, but. Uh, have you already done Janice? No. Are you going to do anything about Janice? Yes, well, I, Albert Grossman died, and... Uh, oh, he did? Yeah, Albert Grossman just died the last month, and that was a great mm -hmm. clue to Janice. I'm going up to San Francisco to talk to... I'm doing a whole San Francisco chapter in this thing with Jerry Garcia and Grace Slick and Bill Graham and Country Joe, and I'm sure we'll talk about Janice. Uh, Janice had... And such, somebody did tell me about it. I, Paul Rothschild was doing her last album, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And how she broke up with a guy, and it really bothered her, and that she really wasn't suicidal. She didn't intend to kill herself. Or, or, and, you have any theories about uh, Jim Morrison? How he died? Why he died? Or anything? <laughs> oh, God. Well, I think he was, for one thing, he was very sick when he went over to Paris. And, uh, you know, he was coughing up blood and stuff. So, I think that it would have been very easy for him to, after a night of drinking, to uh, take a snort of something and not know what it was, maybe. A couple of snorts, like Jim used to do a big snort. And uh, just go in the bathtub and just kind of fall asleep and drown. You know, I, I've just been reading about Charlie Parker because I'm doing Miles Davis. Charlie Parker was so self-destructive. Yeah. He lived the same kind of life. Yeah. Who, uh, who died very young and uh, abused himself so badly. Yeah, yeah so, boy. You know, it's, it's not that it's only musicians or stars, it's, uh, but it's, it's so dramatic when it happens to somebody who's so gifted on one side and, uh, and so self-destructive on the other side. Boy, it's amazing. Yeah, so many guys are like that. You wouldn't have traded the whole experience for anything, though, would you? No, never. <laughs> it's uh, and and to know that you, uh, you what you did lives on and will live on in terms of whatever cultural history this country has. That this group uh, will briefly. Yeah, I just hope they don't fuck the movie up. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be so easy. It's a pretty good chance they will. Yeah. You see any of the cruisers? Yeah. Yeah, which was some, you know, thin veiled uh, attempt to. Yeah. Uh, but that's, you know, when you fly through your life here, and to know that you made an impact like that, that's good, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's pretty heavy. Get a kick out of when you hear the songs on the radio now? Yeah, yeah. still do. Shoot, still do. Yeah, I, I only want one of my new songs on the radio. Yeah. I've got a new dance song coming out. Who's doing it? Pretty soon. Um, my group, it's called Robbie's Hobby. Oh, no. You got a label deal? <laughs> yeah, I think MCA is going to do it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good song. You still enjoy making music? Yeah, I love it. I'm really into the computers and synthesizers and all that now. Have you done anything else over the last few years? Uh, you know, in the last 10, 15 years? Have you done uh, another career or... Gone into civilian life at all? <laughs> Not really, just music. Still been in music. I'm trying to get into soundtracks now, too. Is John Densmore doing much in music? 
Yeah. I mean, he's trying to be an actor. Yeah, Ray is very active, isn't he? He produced, I know he produced an album to me with X. With X, yeah. And, uh, I, so I assume he's still in the music business uh, to some extent. Yeah, I think so. You know, he hasn't done anything good yeah. lately, but he's, he's trying. Robbie, thank you very much for this. I, uh, I appreciate yeah. this. You know,